rejected this Jewish teaching that they're spreading. How can you believe that when they put this on me? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord. He tells these Galatians, don't you trouble me with this anymore. I don't want to hear about circumcision from you anymore. Oh, this is how I feel. I have not borne what the Apostle Paul has borne. And it's just not me, it's all of you. Some of us have lost our families. Some of us, our families hate us because we've decided to follow Jesus. Don't you come to me and tell me God wants me to have a happy family. Amen. Some of God's people have left wealth and earthly security to follow Jesus, to be used of God. Don't you stand and tell the people of God that God wants them to have happy families and sound finances and a great retirement and riches in this world. The people of God bear the marks of the cross of Christ. Don't preach the world to us. Amen. We left it behind. Amen. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. Refraining from circumcision doesn't count for anything either. Non-participation in fleshly things will not avail anything either. Some of the same things Brother Tim mentioned. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't curse, I don't cheat on my wife, I don't watch television, I don't read the latest religious literature, I don't do the praise and worship thing, I don't have a worldview. This abstinence of itself is to no avail either but a new creature. Amen. Here is what avails us of everything that God has for us. The new creature, the new man, the new nature avails us of every needed resource, Amen. both in this life and in the world to come and in the judgment. The new creation will prevail to be justified of God. The new nature will profit the believer in this life and in the day of judgment. Now, first, to enter into this discussion, a person has to believe what God has said about the new nature or the new creation, the new creature. This is not a part of you that was there all along, lying dormant, and that Jesus stirred up. The new creation is not a new thought process. It's not a new list of rules. The new creation or the new man is just exactly what God has said. He's you. He's the believer. And he is new. He's a new creation. This part of you did not exist before. God created you all over again. And this nature did not come from Adam. He does not have Adam's propensity to sin. The new man is born of God and is like God in righteousness and true holiness. He cannot possibly be anything else. Just as Adam's nature cannot possibly lead to anywhere but sin and death. The new man can be put off. He can be subjugated to the carnal nature. He can be ignored, if you will, but he cannot be corrupted like Adam's race. The new man cannot sin, nor does he want to sin, nor can he be tempted to sin. The new man only wants to please God, and he cannot do anything but please God. Now, if you don't believe these things are true, then you are in great danger because the only alternative is to try to tame the flesh or discipline the flesh into pleasing God. Paul goes on to say, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. <clears throat> now this rule is a standard, it's a boundary, or particularly, I like this definition, a sphere of activity. Literally, the Hebrew word is where we get the word canon. It comes from the word cane, like a measuring rod. Notice in all these definitions, none of these are legal definitions. This rule isn't a law or a commandment. And the word walk says walk according to this rule. To walk is to keep step, to keep rank, to behave, exercise self, to live, to be occupied with to conform to virtue and piety, or to walk orderly. So to walk according to this rule, which is the new creature, 
is to behave within the boundaries of the new man, to be occupied within the standard of the new nature. Exercise yourself within the sphere of activity of the new creation. In other words, put off the old man and put on the new man. This will avail much. Now, walking is an action. This is not a one-time act, and you're all set. This is what James calls the perfect law of liberty. James says this two times in chapter 1, verse 25. So whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And then in chapter 2, verse 12, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now if you read the commentators on these texts, <clears throat> you won't find what it means. And many of the so-called Bible translations have garbled it also. Some of them call it the law that makes men free. Among commentators, they referred to it as the law of love, gospel law, law of the gospel, a system of religion judged by this law. One commentator said that there's the law of nature, the law of Moses, and then there's the law of the gospel of Christ. Now, the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary came, oh, so close, but not quite. They said, that is the gospel law of love. Now, mind you, James didn't say law of love. He said law of liberty. Why they seem to interpret liberty as all, the, all these other different things, I don't know. <clears throat> but now, it's not the law of love, but I do like the rest of what they said, which is not a law of external constraint, but of internal, free, instinctive inclination. Amen. They got that part of it right. But you don't get this by obeying. See, with most of the commentators, they look at this as, if you obey this law, then you'll be free. That's not at all what James is saying. No. <clears throat> it's not a commandment to obey. It's a principle. It's a principle of liberty. There is no law that makes men free, as some of the translations have stated it. Not even the law of love or the gospel law. I'm not even sure what that is. I don't know what that even means. Certainly not the law of Moses. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. You mean God's law that was just and holy and good, that wasn't good enough? If if life could have come by a law, it would have been in that law. Amen. Here, here Moses says this way back in Deuteronomy. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Now there's a law. That's a good law. Amen? Amen. Can't live by that. Go ahead. Try to obey that. See if it makes you free. This is the first and greatest commandment. Even Jesus said so. Wouldn't this law give eternal life? It's been around for several thousand years. It's just and it's holy and good. Why hasn't that law brought life to one single man? Because no man in the flesh can do it. You can't obey the laws in the flesh, but the new man can. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If we are to please God, if we are to be justified of God, if we are to receive the heavenly resources that have been made available in Christ Jesus, if we are to pass the judgment without being condemned, then we must be liberated from our flesh from our carnal nature. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he can't even see the kingdom, much less understand it or enter into it. Amen. The law of liberty that James writes about does not make men free when they obey it. Rather, the law itself is freedom. The law is a principle, a work that is happening in the believer not a code that the believer must obey. James not, is not speaking of a commandment that gives liberty, but of the principle of liberty, or, as we saw, a sphere of activity. 